The next lecture is going to be given by Professor Bengt Holmström, and here are his uh, stats. He, he was born in Helsinki. He got his PhD from Stanford, and he's now a professor of economics and management at MIT. And I would like to invite uh, Professor Holmström to come up here and give his lecture. Thank you too much. Uh, I want to thank the Academy, the Royal Academy, um, for uh, bestowing us with this great, great honor. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, there are a lot of friends here. It's very difficult to see from here where they are. But uh, it's much appreciated. And I must say that I'm delighted to share this prize with uh, with my uh, somewhat senile friend, Oliver, uh, who, who is, uh, is uh, very close to me. Uh, I want to uh, try to say something about my book, obviously, but I also want to try to convey in this lecture a little bit how, how we think, or I at least think about theory. I'm a theorist. And, uh, and, you know, economics may sometimes seem like it's uh, either incomprehensibly stupid or trivial, uh, but nothing in between. And I'm going to try to explain uh, some of the thinking that may seem obvious, but uh, actually uh, requires uh, some further thought. And, uh, and so uh, that uh, was telling something about my journey uh, is, uh, is basically the plan, a narrative of how I got into incentives and, uh, and, uh, and what were key steps in one of the strands of, of uh, what I've done, uh, especially motivating workers. So in some sense, it complements Oliver's talk in that uh, it, I'm focused more on contracts, uh, broadly construed, and I'm, uh, I'm also focused on, on contracts within the firm rather than uh, between firms. I want to say a word about how I got into it, uh, because it's unusual, so slightly unusual. We, it, I, I didn't plan to be an economist, and I didn't start off on that track. I went off, uh, I was a mathematician, an applied mathematician. I went to work for a firm in Finland that's called Alstom. It was one of the top 10 firms, in, in, and a progressive firm. It, uh, it, it's a big conglomerate. It had uh, 30 factories or so. And I was hired uh, as for a very specific task, which was to, uh, to implement a big corporate uh, planning model. Uh, corporate planning models of that sort don't exist anymore, and I hope, I hope for some of the reasons I will explain. Uh, but, uh, but that was the rage at the time. Any progressive firm would want to have a big planning model. We are talking about the linear programming model, for those who know what that means. Uh, thousands of equations, uh, uh, thousands of activities, uh, five year out, plans about investment, plans about production, all how they depend and integrate, you know, describing sort of the inner workings of the firm. Uh, it was terrific in the sense that it was a wonderful way for somebody like me who was a mathematician to actually come to learn about how a big company works. I, I, I got to work with the CEO, CFO, not with the CEO, a very charismatic CFO uh, who, who was a very tough guy, but uh, somehow took a liking to me because uh, he liked that I said what I thought. And, uh, and uh, he would then say when I, pretty often, when I thought wrongly. But we got along very well. And, uh, and so I started on this work by collecting information from these factories. I went out to the factories and talked to them. And it didn't take very long to realize that this seemed like a pretty meaningless task, in the sense that uh, you know, what these guys were in the factories uh, uh, worried about was, first of all, that you know, some new gadget comes and you know, somehow screws up their life. Uh, but secondly, uh, they were gaming it. You know, they were sort of asking indirectly, almost directly questions. You know, what should I put in to get maximally things out for myself? 
And, uh, and I, I don't think they were doing it to cheat uh, people, but they had the view that headquarters didn't know what they were doing. And so, you know, they had to somehow adjust, you know, not send the numbers that were true, but send some other numbers so that that would kind of correct what the headquarters thought about. So I could see that there were, you know, the two sides of the problem was the neither side somehow uh, had the full information, and, uh, and this was a, a complicated problem, completely swamping the problem of actually calculating this gigantic uh, you know, model, which itself was, of course, complicated. So I suggested that uh, let's scan it. And uh, subsequently, I heard they, they, they thought for a moment to fire me, but uh, the CFO uh, uh, saved me and said, well, let's put him to work on something else. And the something else was very small models, uh, incentive models, and uh, you know, various uh, you know, versions of how do we incentivize these people in the right way. Uh, in South, looking at it now, pretty pathetic. But, uh, but you know, I tried my best, uh, models about in incentives and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and then I got the lucky draw, which was I was awarded a, a scholarship to go to Stanford for a sabbatical from this firm. And the lucky draw really wasn't just Stanford. It was that, uh, that I realized incentives was actually also an interest of economists at the time. And I, I, uh, I, and I got to go to Bob Wilson's class, which was a, a, an iconic class at the business school. Bob Wilson subsequently became an advisor. I'm very glad that he's here with, with us here today. And he, uh, I asked him about the incentives, and he pointed me to, to work uh, that was worth reading. First, I thought it was uh, gibberish, but eventually I started to realize it was uh, actually made made kind of sense. I don't know uh, if you will think that way. So that's, uh, that's how I ended up uh, where I am right now. And, uh, and, uh, and I feel pretty pleased about it. Uh, so I write paper for, for, for four months uh, and beyond because uh, the, the, I have a very simple narrative in the sense that, you know, I went there, like most people, I thought that uh, paper for four months is the thing, the sort of medicine for incentive problems. And after 30 or so years of studying it, I'm more or less thinking paper the form, pay for performance to simplify is the problem. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, if this sounds like the Republicans, you know, maybe it is. Uh, but I'm going to start with a simple paper performance story, uh, you know, the way we studied it in the early days. And by the way, Wilson wrote a very early paper on it in 69, and Steve Ross, another friend, uh, in 73, and so on. So they, there was a literature that I began with, and I will ta start from that literature and then uh, show you uh, how I uh, uh, developed it together with co-authors how I developed in, uh, it further into the view that I was just suggesting, that, uh, that uh, this problem is much more than about pay for performance. So I call it the principal agent problem. That's the language we use. I'm not going to use any equations and such. I had such slides, but I decided to take a, uh, it away because I'm trying to explain it. it it's, a, it's a canonic model, a sort of simplified model of a, 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 situa a, a complicated situation where there's just one principal, a boss, say, an employee uh, is the agent, uh, uh, the employer is the boss. It could be a client uh, who is the is the boss in the case of, of, of hiring a lawyer who is the agent. It could be the board, which is the boss, and the CEO, who is the agent, uh, and so on. It's a model that kind of just studies the question of what kind of incentive pay would be suitable in a very generic context. And there are two difficulties uh, that uh, makes the model uh, sort of is the interest of the model. And that is uh, preferences are not aligned and performance are imperfectly measured. And these two things make the problem a complication. And I come to that just in a second. But then, uh, secondly, there's the, the incentive 
is, as I said, just a contract where based, me be based on measured performance, which, as I said just a moment ago, was uh, imperfect. So that's the setup. And it's good usually, we usually start by saying what is the first best meaning? What, if, we, if we didn't have these problems, what would be the solution? And uh, actually, Thomas already mentioned it, but the first best cases are two. Actually, there are three, but I want to just mention two. Agent's choice is verifiable, so we can actually observe what you are doing, what the employee is doing. In that case, the contract is just written so that uh, it says, do this, or then you don't get any pay, or you get the punishment, or something like that. So it's a, and then because the agent typically is risk averse, and that's, uh, I, did I mention the risk aversion, or? Yeah, it's a preference are not a line. I should have mentioned it's because the agent is risk averse and the principal is risk neutral. So the agent doesn't like to carry risk. So uh, the idea is to pay the agent a fixed wage if the agent didn't have any action that uh, would have to be incentivized. The other case is where the agent is risk neutral, in which case uh, the doesn't worry about the risk and therefore uh, could carry the whole, uh, the whole risk for himself. This is the case we call uh, a rental agreement, or it's a, uh, the agent is a residual claimant. Uh, just to give you a sense, taxi cab drivers typically are on this scheme. It's very difficult to measure their performance, so they actually are residual claimants. They, they rent the car from somebody who owns the car and then, and, and then uh, get the mo most, if, if not every, all of the income from, from driving. This gives the right incentives. They are like you know, their own owner. Uh, when they are driving. But in the general case, the second best uh, is in this model one about uh, balancing incentives against risk. And rather than saying how this is studied and so on, you know, let me say my contribution to this, uh, this part was to try to understand how this model was thinking. This is a very big part of the way uh, I look at this theory. It's, a, it's an experiment. It's crucial to try to understand what, how the model thinks. And then uh, if we can't do that, then that's not a, a model that uh, I typically like to work on. So, uh, and I emphasize the fact that uh, sometimes you think you understand it, but you actually don't. So this informativeness principle may sound very simple. So it says that uh, I asked the question, or actually it was asked before, uh, the question of, uh, instead of asking what should the incentive scheme look like, one, uh, a preceding question is, uh, what information is valuable for incentive contracting? And the answer sounds kind of silly or, or, or trivial. Anything that is informative about the agent's choice of action should go into it. And this is something that uh, Steve Chabell and I uh, jointly uh, discovered and both papers were published uh, uh, together in the same volume. But what is not so trivial about this is that uh, a lot of people actually thought at the time this is not the case. So the going view was that if uh, some signal is noisy enough about what you are doing, then it's worthless. So this is, a, in that sense, a surprising answer. It is not the reason. It, Another way of looking at it is to look at an old accounting principle. So if you read accounting books in the Times, they would say pay should only depend on variables that the agent can control. Sounds like a very sensible principle too. But if you look at the relative performance, to take one of the applications of the informativeness principle, you will see that relative performance means that if you do something and I'm paying you for it, I may want to see somebody else who's doing something similar to you and taking, seeing how well is that person doing and then based on that uh, decide whether to pay you a lot or a little or, or, or adjust the payment by sort of the circumstances. And the point is that because the, pre the agent is not the sole producer of the performance measure, there's luck, either bad luck or good luck, that also affects the performance measure. Then filtering out something about that noise that shouldn't be there to get a better and more perfect performance measure, that's where the relative performance is very, very valuable. So actually, 
taking something the agent cannot control helps me take out something that the agent can't control in the original measure. That's the logic of why it is actually good, and thereby reducing the risk. And, uh, and so the controllability principle got to be adjusted. Accountants change their, the way they define controllability. The measure becomes more controllable thanks to relative performance evaluation. Uh, I think the informativeness principle wouldn't be talked about as much, or I'm not thinking so much about it uh, for, uh, I should say, by the way, that it has been used now as a, this, this aspect of my work has been heavily used for telling that, uh, that CEOs should be paid for, not for luck, uh, bad or good, but typically for, for good luck. So people, you know, various corporate governance uh, advocates are very big on this idea that they should, they should uh, their pay should be adjusted as a function of macroeconomic circumstances and so on. Doesn't seem to happen quite that way. And I don't want to get into that. For me, the informativeness, or for this narrative, the informativeness, the importance of it is that it tells exactly actually how the model thinks. So the fact that, 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 uh, that you get uh, this principle holds, is, it's saying that all the, uh, all the minute pieces of information about the agents, uh, uh, whether the agent did what sort of was expected of the agent, uh, is relevant for evaluating the agent. Uh, what it, expl it explains several puzzles, and, and I come to one uh, just shortly, but uh, basically explains why, uh, why the model tends to produce extremely complicated answers. You know, the, you don't get a linear scheme, you don't get a, a, a necessarily a, a, say, single bonus scheme or anything that you see in reality or option or whatnot. Uh, that's the con part of this principle. It just basically says nothing about the shape, except for very rare circumstances. So the, it is oversensitive to the information, but it also, by being oversensitive, it does explain, we understand exactly how this thinks. And one place where it is especially con important is in an example, a striking example that Murley's brought up in, uh, in a paper in 1976, where he basically said that if you look at the simplest of, of examples, mathematical examples, where the agent has put in an effort and then you add a noise term, and the noise term is uh, what we call normally distributed, meaning it's the very familiar bell-shaped uh, uh, distribution function that we all know about. This seems like the obvious example to look at. And uh, this does not give a sensible sounding answer. The way, the optimal incentive actually doesn't first of all exist, but you can approximate arbitrarily closely the first best by increasingly punishing the agent for increasingly bad outcomes. So somewhere far out in the tail when you perform, you were supposed to perform at 100 and you get minus 10,000, you know, then we really punish you hard. And that will keep you working just the way I want it. And for the most part, you are just paid a, a flat wage. Now, uh, Paul Milgram and I looked at this example and wrote, in, by the way, this, I should say, informativeness exactly explains why this is the case. Because the, the model, the tail of the normal distribution is hugely informative. And so this model sort of, you're paying the person exactly as a function of how much information there is in the outcome signal uh, with regard to uh, whether the, uh, the agent did what uh, was expected or not. So Paul Miglam and I uh, looked at this example and, and we sort of, uh, I had been working for a while here, I wasn't happy with this model, the basic model, you know, I was doing well in the labor market, but I wasn't feeling well because this work <laughs> didn't seem to be right. Uh, I mean, I understood the model was correct, but it wasn't uh, giving what we wanted. So uh, I, I uh, invited Paul to work on me, uh, with me, and we, this was, uh, uh, you talked about 10 days, I think we sp spent about a week or so, and we sort of figured out uh, it was a simpler problem, Oliver, don't worry. Uh, the, uh, I think actually we spent three hours, but I didn't want to. Uh, so, uh, very simple answer. 
the linear incentive is optimal in our model, just to cut it short, is because it puts the same incentive pressure. It's not sensitive, linear schemes are not sensitive to, to the fine details of information. And another way of putting it is the MERL is extreme, it's a very extreme scheme to pay, you know, when you, in the very tail of a, of a distribution. If you just change the situation a little bit, or you make another little, you know, your, your, your view of measurement error was not exactly correct, then it all falls apart. So the linear scheme was robust in a sense. And, uh, and this, uh, I would say that this has led to its own literature, and it sort of shifted the literature towards a view where we're actually looking at the model where the agent, just one little thing such as the level of effort, is actually not the simplest case to study. It's about the most complicated thing to study because the behavior of the model is so erratic, despite the seeming simplicity. And I think this is a very important thing because a lot of people walked around and looked at Merle's case and said, you know, well, that's ridiculous. Let's just study linear incentives because it's simpler. This, this is not relevant for us. So this is a, I mean, you don't do theory in order to just dismiss a model that says you should really punish people at the very tail of the distribution, which is a, anything but linear, and then you say, okay, thank you for the advice, and then I just go and assume something. So this is, to me, a very deep lesson with regard to doing theory. We do theory to listen to what the model says, and then we go and find out why it's saying it. And in this case, uh, it led to the insight that we were looking at the wrong kinds of models. So the models with one task, uh, uh, in this case, the, by the way, the dynamic model is one with a lot of actions, with the, with the agent, the basic intuition is that the agent has a lot more control over his performance if he chooses things dynamically over time against the bonus or against the Moly scheme. Uh, but I don't want to speak about uh, the, the linear model, except to say that uh, the, the, thing, the, the thing that uh, caught the eye of Paul and me was the fact that, uh, that the, first of all, the linear model worked uh, logically. You know, it, it, you ask it a question, so, you know, what about if there's less risk? Well, then you can pay the agent a steeper incentive because the agent is risk averse. What if uh, the agent is less risk averse? Then you also pay a steeper incentive that is a higher commission. What if the value of the agent's effort is higher? All these are right answers. Let me just explain. If you had asked these questions for the first, uh, first, uh, or the, the the first model I was talking about, you would get no answer or you, go, you could get co completely crazy answers. So uh, the thing that is, however, hidden in this answer and, and, and that shows that when you look at this model in detail is that, that there was a little th detail in the story that we had ignored sort of for 10 years at least in, in, in this, uh, which is that it also depended how much bang for the buck you get if the raise the incentive. And this comes from the agent's cost function. And it became important because it meant that actually you have another instrument than paying the agent. You can also perhaps change the cost function of the agent. So we got into the idea of multitasking, the idea of multiple instruments. And so let me give just a short uh, review uh, of, of the multitasking or some examples. When you have many tasks, I think the game sort of for us changed completely. It was not about level effort, it's about do, do people allocate their effort correctly? And it's actually challenging because there are some tasks that are very easy to measure and there are some tasks that are hard to measure. And you, can, you have to sort of consider the fact that even though you can easily observe one, if you raise, say, Take the quantity versus quality, where quantity usually is easy to measure, quality is hard to measure. If you raise the, the incentive on, qu on quantity, then that makes it harder to incentivize quality. And in fact, in the first instance, the agent will allocate away effort from quality into quantity. 
And we will see many examples like that. The same appears in short-term versus long-term uh, decisions. If you push the short-term, you will have a problem with the long-term and so on. And, uh, and so let me jump to the scandals, which has been, uh, which uh, are very often functions of this multitasking problem. And there is even the saying of you get what you pay for is, uh, is uh, one of the problems. So Wells Fargo is a very recent case in, in the US. You know, they were, the Wells Fargo workers were found to have uh, manufactured, I think, over a million fake accounts. I mean, they had names like Holmstrom and Hart, but we didn't know that there were such accounts. And, and they were used, there was no money in it, but because they were paid for creating accounts and various products and selling them, then they got bonuses, and, uh, and uh, the life was uh, happy for a couple of years, but no longer, and now, now I think uh, about 5,000 people have been fired. And uh, the CEO, of course, had to step out. So that's an example of where you start pushing people. It's not that they are evil, by the way. Some may be, but you know, that's, I don't believe that. That's my, not my experience. It's just that they are, so much is expected of them, that they, they in a, some sort of, uh, uh, some people lose it, and they, they just feel like they have to manufacture somehow uh, in response to what's required in order to hold on to their job. So the BP and oil gulf spill, which is, uh, is I think, uh, in the memory of some of you, uh, is, a, is a disastrous case of this, in that uh, BP will highly incentivize. I mean, there are other stories of this, but I, I was actually working for McKinsey at the time and saw this closely. Uh, very aggressive, uh, uh, very aggressive top-down uh, demands that uh, people should deliver, you know, find, discover oil, pump oil, you know, do what the wildcatters, the entrepreneurs were doing so well. And uh, I, I think it, it is clear that uh, that, that, that left sh led to shading in terms of quality. Enron is an example of misaligned incentives. So this is an old problem. It actually goes back to General Motors uh, and, and Fisher Body, is that you, you, uh, you, you, have, you have somebody working for you who is actually basically owning a subsidiary. You give the subsidiary to some, you incentivize these people for the subsidiary, but you don't realize that, that, that they are just going to, you know, they have total imbalance. They are 100% of the subsidiary or 1% of Enron. That's not a very... Uh, very natural situation or correct situation for incentives. And teachers are a, a big subject in the US right now, but, uh, that uh, teaching the test, which is not wrong in principle, but it just cuts into the value of having teachers uh, actually give, uh, teach students what they also need, namely social skills, verbal skills, presentation skills. All that is very hard to measure. So uh, that leads to problems. And, and so what is the remedy? So the remedy here, and let's leave this, uh, the, the, the sort of insight of multitasking is that there are two ways you can stimulate, uh, say, uh, presentation skills in school if you're a teacher. One, or, or get a teacher to, uh, to allocate time for that. One is to pay more, somehow measure after all, how they present these students and you know, have some context or have opinions about uh, that. But the easier task typically is don't incentivize competing tasks. So it's actually a story that leads to this multitasking story is, multitasking story is very much connected to low-powered incentives. That is, low-powered incentives in many, many situations, no incentive financial, monetary, pecuniary incentives is actually the best incentive for something else. So even if something is perfectly measurable and on its own that task could be perfectly incentivized, first best, as I called it, you actually don't do anything. You, don't, you ignore that information and you, don't, you, don't, you pay uh, your pay is independent of it. The, the idea which floats around a lot also, and people have an instinct and workers like, well, pay me for what I can control. That can be very dangerous and damaging for the same reason. Because it's easy to produce results, but it's the wrong kinds of results. So I come to the important uh, corollary 
of this multitasking is multiple instruments. You say, well, what do I do if I can't incentivize? I can't pay anything. You know, pay for performance is not the right uh, uh, the rule. The answer is uh, they are alternatives inside the firm especially. And it sort of builds on this red thing at the bottom. Employees want to be appreciated. You know, I've spent 13 years on, our, uh, on, in, on the Nokia board. We got every year these yearly evaluations of what workers like and don't like about Nokia. In the top three always, I would love to know better what my boss wants me to do. That is, there is this craving that I, they, in the firm, you try to influence people's views of you. It's a, you know, you want to do good perhaps, but above all, you want to be appreciated. You want to know what will, what will it take to be appreciated. It's a little bit like uh, one of the emails I got about the Nobel Prize. What should I do to get a Nobel Prize, it said. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, there was another person who wanted to be appreciated. Uh, uh, so the other thing is, uh, so then the job design is a very important way. So you have these sort of vaguer, weaker measures of, of, or, or, or drivers of performance. Then you can, the firm has a lot of instruments used for so channeling that energy, if you wish, or the desire. And that is through job design. You can split up, for instance, dealing with this easy to measure or hard to measure. You can split up the jobs. You have two different kinds of teachers, those that just teach math and those that teach, uh, teach um, uh, performance or, 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 or speaking skills or whatever is hard to measure. Uh, bureaucratic rules, which people tend to think, I mean, that's the vogue now, but how do we incentivize this, uh, this poorly performing, uh, performing uh, government? Uh, the answer is, uh, in general, you don't. You know, the, uh, I, you know when, when people come with the ideas that they should come and bring incentive base into the government, that is very, very uh, uh, frustrating. So, uh, I... There's just, here's authority, career path, supervision, recruiting, there's, there's just tons of instruments inside the firm. So the, inside, the firm can, first of all, tap into the, much more powerfully tap into the design, desire of people to be appreciated. And that opens up uh, all other instruments that are non-pecuniary, non-performance, pay-for performance instruments. So uh, I got the, uh, let me just, uh, conclude by saying there's a lot beyond pay for performance. Multitasking problem, this measurement problem, this sort of imbalance that you get if you have many tasks, it happen, it's just not coming only for pay for performance. Uh, there are, they are there's career concerns and other drivers that uh, can lead to problems. Uh, the water point you with anti roll has a paper on it. There's, uh, uh, a desire to be appreciated uh, uh, leads to influence costs that Milgram and Roberts have talked about. Uh, by the way, the asset ownership is an instrument, and, and we just heard Oliver talk about prisons. That's a multitasking problem, misalignment problem. And uh, one of the things I just leave you with is the world, I think the nature of work is changing uh, dramatically. And, uh, and you have your phones, you probably, some of you are reading your phones, you are multitasking, you know, you are not, lose, uh, you are not getting the valuable wisdom in this lecture. Uh, you know, it's a problem. And, uh, and uh, we can do, we can't, you know, that's one of the things that I think uh, worry me a little bit is that you don't know what, what your workers are doing, but you may have to increase your punishment significantly for, for instance, trying to run a, a separate business in, 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 while you are doing something, you're actually d using your, your mobile phone to run a couple of other businesses or whatever it is. And it turns out that punishments are getting extremely severe for this kind of activity. And that is also, it's going back to my original uh, informative, that is actually uh, 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 the right thing from the incentive point of view too, because you don't have to do that. There's no error term in that sense, and therefore uh, the, uh, the punishments should be very severe. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh. I, hold on. I, 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 here, I forgot entirely that here I have my whole
support troops. And um, Bob Wilson, you see my advisor, is in the top. We haven't written anything. Everybody else is a co-author. But Paul Milgram is to the left, and Shanti Roll to the right, and uh, Oliver uh, got a prominent place. I do remember your name. Uh, and, uh, and John Roberts, unfortunately, can't be here. But wonderful people. Uh, Gary is here. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that's the people who are here. Just wonderful people to work with. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, Professor Hart to uh, come up on stage. We can go from the team. Thank you.